Captain's Log Supplemental. We've been traveling through space now since we arrived in space. We have cataloged 23 different planets, and a voice keeps shouting, Oh God, oh God, why do you keep asking questions about all of these useless planets? This is our quest. We will scan every single imaginary planet that our Game Master can possibly throw against us. We will make them come up with at least a hundred different names, and we will question them about the elemental composition of the atmosphere of each of those planets, and we will needlessly conduct elemental surveys of the surface crust of each of the moons, planets, and stars in every single galaxy we can possibly come across. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and I'm going to hopefully be helping you to become a better GM. Today's video was a request on Discord. A request that was sent through saying, Oh, sci-fi worlds, why are you know what to do? Oh... When you think about a science fiction campaign that's set in a universe that perhaps is of your own creating, or perhaps that is, well, an old existing universe like Star Trek or Star Wars or the Farscape universe or the Firefly universe, there are bound to be instances where you have players discovering a planet that hasn't been catalogued or listed in one of the thousands of fan sites out there, and you need to come up with a planet on the fly. How do you do it? Where do you start? What do you even have to think about? Well, your players are going to be asking you all kinds of probing questions, and if you're sitting there going, oh, well, it's round, that isn't going to help anybody. So we're going to be looking at today how to make sure that when your players come across a planet, you've got pretty much everything at your fingertips in order to give them a surface view idea of what's going on on that planet and to make it an interesting place to either visit or not visit. And it all depends on a few circumstances. What is the purpose of the planet in our game? We're going to unpack that. There are various purposes that a planet can serve within your universe, and we're going to just look and see how each of those is going to determine what kind of information you need to give your players. We're going to look at some details, some effects in terms of what does the atmosphere have to do with the planet's crust, for example. Nothing or everything. You'd be surprised. We're going to do a little bit of armchair geology and climatology to unpack how to make your planets seem as if they are real bodies floating out there in the heavens. And then we're going to look at the locals. Are you local? We're going to look at the locals. The locals, what inhabits the planet, what is likely to inhabit the planet, and and unpack it a little bit. Now, if you really want to go further in, I did a video many, 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 many moons ago. See what I did there? I did a video a long time ago on evolving the alien, which was looking at how to make aliens that are not just stock standard actors in latex. Because, well, after all, you've got a budget that is almost infinite since it's all in our heads. Right, let's jump right into it. The purpose in game. What is the purpose of the planet? Why, why am I here, says the planet. Planets can serve several different purposes. The first one can be discovery. Your crew are on a spaceship and they're hunting down some ancient treasure and they have to find a specific planet within a solar system and they're kind of following clues and things. But it is a planet that they are heading to and they have discovered, so it's a new planet. Now, part of the story mechanic here is that you are forewarned. You know that they're going to a new planet, so you can spend a little bit of time prepping this planet before they get there. In other words, you can figure out all of these things, but not necessarily on the fly. Alternatively, it could be that some effect hurtles the ship forward. Perhaps you're playing Battlestar Galactica and they do a jump and there's a catastrophe during the jump and they pop out of space somewhere and you throw out there because you are just casually making up this as you go along. Oh, there's a planetary system half a click away. And the players decide we're going to go there. So they're going to discover the planet. It is not something that is known to the players. And therefore, it is something that you can make up a lot easier than something else that the players are aware of, for example. 
recovery. The players might need to go and recover something from the planet. What that means is, unlike a discovery, a discovery does not require that the players be able to access the planet. So you can go wild. You could have a planet that's made entirely out of frozen methane, and the center is a little ball of methane, and the extremities is this wonderful liquid methane gas, and if any kind of flame is introduced, the entire planet will explode. Because discovery doesn't require that the players land on the planet, or the characters anyway. Recovery, however, does. It doesn't mean that the planet needs to be particularly and welcoming. It doesn't mean that they have to have a nice time whilst doing it. But it does mean in order for them to retrieve whatever it is that is on this planet, they are going to have to be able to access that planet somehow. It would be unfair of you as a game master to say, uh, you need to report to planet 13 beta 12-5A and recover a crashed stolen data computer from a starship. Oh, and by the way, the entire atmosphere is filled with sulfuric acid and all of your EVA suits simply will get eaten away and there's nothing you can do. That's not a mission. The mission would be the planet has sulfuric pools all over the place because the atmosphere is full of sulfur dioxide and it rains every six hours, which turns the sulfur dioxide into the air into sulfuric acid. And so you need to take extra precautions because your suits won't survive. Now it's a recovery on a timer. It's become a dramatic mission. So recovery requires the players be able to access the planet. So you need to think a little bit more in depth about that. The discovery one, it could be a gas giant, it could be anything. So you're okay there. Refuge. Refuge is frequently what planets are used for. The players are busy escaping from some giant galactic force and they hide on a planet. Whether it's at the poles to try and mask their signature or whether they actually land on the planet. Again, refuge like discovery, you need to be able to give them a planet that they can actually land on. Because otherwise, if they can't land on it to make their repairs and the like, they're going to fly to the next planet and so on until they either get caught, run out of fuel, die of starvation, or they find a planet they can land on. So they're going to want to land on a planet. Now, it is also entirely up to you as to whether they will be able to actually repair themselves on that planet. Again, with refuge, it needs to be habitable for the players in some shape or form, and it needs to necessitate that they can actually repair their vehicle. Again, it doesn't have to be easy. You don't just have to give everything to them on a silver platter, but they must be able to access it somehow. If you take an example here of a refuge in an unlikely planetoid, a, a heavenly body, just look at Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, where the Millennium Falcon lands inside an asteroid. Now the asteroid shouldn't have any kind of atmosphere, it should be exposed to the vacuum unless it's particularly large, but for the purposes of the story, Han Solo and Princess Leia and Chewbacca needed to walk outside of the Millennium Falcon with just breather apparatus on because spacesuits, blah, it takes too much time and it's a costume and all that kind of stuff. So they just walked outside and there was this giant slug thing that they were wandering on. Anyway, but they were able to get their refuge from the Empire and ultimately escape. Could it be a visit? Now, if it's a visit, that means it's by invitation or it's be, there's some kind of sanction behind it. What that means is, is that it sh then should have a whole lot of hospitality around that. Again, it could be to a planet that is completely covered in poison gases and deadly creatures. But there is an environmental uh, station or space that the players have been invited to, the player characters have been invited to, and they will then go there. So then your thoughts are not necessarily the same as recovery and refuge, where they need to be able to access the outside of the planet, but they do need a safe space where they can visit, successfully negotiate, do whatever the reason is for their visiting. So those, to me, are the four real reasons why planets should exist and the differentiators that go along with them. Discovery, you don't have to have a hospitable environment. Recovery, it needs to be doable in an environment in terms of getting out. Refuge, it needs to be okay, it can still be dangerous. And then visit, it should be fine. And perhaps there are other things beyond that which cause problems. Random is the last one, and it is sometimes a dangerous one. Again, if your players want to scan every planet in the solar system, 
you don't need to, nor are you obliged to report every single thing on those planets. Don't overburden yourself with trying to give out as much information as you can. Rather simply say, give me those checks, give me those rolls. You complete your survey. Your survey indicates this is a fairly humdrum system, or the planet is a fairly neutral system, iron core, nothing of particular note, rather mild temperatures and the like. And don't go any further than that. If they then try and land on that planet, then you need to think what type of adventure do you really want this planetary landing to be? If they're doing it randomly, maybe they're on a mission to go and do something else, and for whatever reason they decide to stop on a random planet. Well, now you can decide what type of thing it is, what type of planet it is, and then that will help you in terms of determining what your random planet is. So that's all very good and well in terms of working out the planet's purpose within your game, but then how and what should we give to the players in terms of information? Generally speaking, this is the information that I would give to them. Gravity, temperature, atmosphere, water, and then composition, if it's of any value. So those are the five things that I usually try to give to my players. High, low gravity. If it's high gravity, if it's strong gravity, there's a big pull down. So in order for things to gain height, they have to be stronger. They need to resist against that gravity. If it's low gravity and everyone can just bounce around, then generally things will be weaker because they don't have to resist the effects of gravity as much. That's a very basic interpretation of gravity. So think about it in those terms. Think about it in terms of, okay, how is that going to affect the PCs when they arrive? If the gravity is stronger than that they're used to, so if it's stronger than basic Earth gravity, they're going to suffer. They're going to take a lot more energy to move around. Each step becomes a struggle as if they weighted down. If it's a lighter gravity, then there are risks that they could jump off the planet if they jump too high. But there's also the risk that if they jump, they might go up four or five meters and then come down 20 meters further away than they had intended to. So there's a whole reassigning of, okay, hang on a moment, I can't run because if I run, I run the risk of jumping and I can't control how far I go, etc., etc. So it makes it more interesting. Temperature. The temperature is important. Now, all over Earth, we have varying temperatures. Currently, there's huge temperature swings towards hotter climes in our colder environments. So Europe is currently sweating under a heat wave. Africa is in a cold spell, all those kinds of interesting things. Weather uh, temperature, I should say, is going to determine how easily it is for your characters to operate on the planet. An incredibly high temperature, dehydration becomes a problem, so they're going to have to worry about those kinds of things. An incredibly low temperature, freezing, permafrost results in... Um, frostbite on the hands and the fingers and things so you can really have fun playing around with it however when you're trying to come up with a planet that seems like a real planet once you've decided okay well it's got a high temperature and it's got a low temperature then ask yourself about the atmosphere does it have an atmosphere? And if it does have an atmosphere, that atmosphere is going to have wind currents. There are going to be periods where some parts of the planet are warmer than others. And as we know from basic physics, hot air rises, cold air sinks, and that causes high and low pressure systems all over our planet. So as a result, we start to get areas of the planet that have got dry spaces and we've got areas that have got very wet spaces very warm and very cold in other words we don't end up with a tatooine or a hoth where it's the same everywhere those can occur and they do occur and earth has been through some of those phases there has been a hoth phase our ice age phase but even in the middle of our ice age phase we still had at the equators not ice age it was very, very cold, but it wasn't covered in ice. So by thinking about your atmosphere, you start to create a more interesting world rather than just, oh, it's a this planet or it's a that planet or it's a that planet. We don't like that. And I don't think that anyone should ever accept that where, oh, the whole planet is a giant desert. OK, so the atmosphere then is basically burnt off, a.k.a. Mars. But even Mars has poles where there's frozen bits and pieces. So the atmosphere is very important. 
And the next one is, is it breathable? Breathable atmosphere allows for the players not to worry about EVA suits, protection from extremes, but oxygen, importantly, allows them to survive and to breathe and to, to, to exist. Now, are there other types of atmospheres out there? Yes, of course there are. There's things like methane atmospheres, argon atmospheres. Any of our great gases can simply become an atmosphere. So the atmosphere is incredibly toxic to humans, but not to the local inhabitants. Equally important is water. How much water, the vasa, the omizu, all of the different words for water. How much water is on the planet? Again, more water indicates oceans. What do oceans do? They have currents. They transfer heat around the planet. They move heat around, whether it's cold or hot, doesn't matter. They move it around the planet. And yes, I know that cold is not the absent. They move things around the planet. They create different environments. So again, we're looking at you. Can you have a hearth planet? Yes, you can. Can you have Tatooine planet? Yes, you can. But if they have significant atmosphere and if they have lots of water, things change. There's a lot of heat distribution and heat movement that happens when you have water and atmosphere combined together. So that makes for a more interesting planet. Again, with water, is it survivable? Is it drinkable water? Is it salt water predominantly? What type of water is it? And again, that's going to inform what your players can and can't do on that planet. And then the composition, how much land versus water is there or how much uh, jungle is available versus desert? What kind of shade is provided? Is there protection from the UV rays of the sun that happens to be the, the controlling force within that solar system? The composition is fairly important, again, simply so that your players know how much lee room they have to operate on that on that planet. So by looking at these five things, if you describe the planet, oh, you can see that the planet is three times the size of Earth and the gravity is much, much heavier. It looks as if it's got a day-night cycle where in the day the temperature rises to 70 degrees Celsius and at night it plummets to minus 170 degrees Celsius. So that's a very uncomfortable environment for humans. It's deadly deadly for humans above 50 degrees and we start to really die quickly the atmosphere is filled with this amazing mixture of two percent oxygen and 80 percent argon that ain't breathable for humans humans be dead it's a big problem there's no water on the planet whatsoever there is no sign of water oh, there we go and it looks as if the majority of it is just this hard rocky space uh, filled with great big sinkholes and chasms not a friendly planet to explore so then we look at the locals the locals are you local the locals the locals let's forget about earth forget about humanoids let's move on from that what about six-legged beings what about 12-legged beings what about floating cubes of jelly what about little spores you know you can really let your imagination run wild unless you're playing in a system where there aren't aliens so the latest Battlestar Galactica for example or if you are playing where there's lots of aliens, then you can go mad. You can absolutely go mad. So what is the technology that would develop as a result of that? So when we look at, say, a planet where what if it's 80 percent covered in ocean and only 20 percent of it is, is, is actual land mass, the majority of animal life is going to have evolved in the ocean. As a result of that, your interesting beings that could be there, you could have these squid like things that to developed intelligence you could have shark people if you wanted to you could have turtle people it doesn't really matter what sort of technology would they develop predominantly technology for surviving underwater which almost allows you to survive in space your spaceship your your capsule needs to be watertight or not it needs to hold water maybe they invented these anti-water craft so the water's inside and they can go up onto land to rove around on land Imagine the humans come across this rocket that is lying on the beach and they open it up and it pours, water just pours out of it. And there are all of these fish people inside of it who were exploring the land and now they're going to start suffocating. So that's an interesting option to explore. What is the adaption that they've had to make? So this creature grew up on a gas planet. There, there is no land. 
it's just lots of swirling mega storms. There's huge amounts of lightning. What do they feed upon? Well, maybe it's other little particles of creatures that float in the air, like plankton floats in our oceans. So maybe they have these gigantic mouths that they fly through the air like manta rays scooping the stuff up. They became intelligent. They started to look at how to manipulate their world. So they started to use microfibers that were floating around in the air as a result of other plant-like life that was releasing that. So they could build bigger nets to catch more food and slowly. Now, all of this doesn't have to run through your head the moment the players land on the planet or get to the planet. You can start to develop this as you go along. So the initial scan is that these giant floating things in the gas giant's atmosphere. What are they? And as your players probe, slowly you can develop. Consistency isn't something that you necessarily need to worry about. Look at Earth. We scan Earth 20,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago. It's inhabited by mostly wild animals that don't display any sign of intelligence. There is one ape-like species that seems to have a community-based society. There's some rough structures made out of grass and wood, but nothing of significance. Come back 10,000 years. Okay, now that ape has suddenly got cities and things. I'm not saying that that is what's necessarily going to happen on the planet as they are getting closer and closer to it. But remember, time is also relative. If you watch Interstellar, one year on the planet's surface is only five months in space and or 20 years. That's way too complicated for our role-playing games as far as I'm concerned. But how have they adapted? And then what's the culture that's developed? Is it a communitive, collective culture of manta rays floating around this gas giant? Or is it? are they hostile to one another? Are they territorial? How does that work? Think of a few little quirks and things. So when you first meet the manta ray, do you disgorge fish in front of it as a sign of supplication and gift giving? Do you have to float next to it for a while? Do you both float with your backs to one another through the gas giant? So you're floating for a little while so that you can touch each other's fin tips whilst communing with the planet. What are the kinds of things that you can come up with? And again, just come up with them on the fly. Just think about a few cool types of things. Don't go too in depth. Don't sort of get yourself stuck in a foxhole. And remember, just because you've encountered one member of the species, that doesn't mean that all members of the species are like that. Are you typical of the culture that you come from? Am I typical of the culture that I come from? Definitely not. Definitely not. So bear that in mind as well. And then finally, think about the attitude and the goals of the locals. So the locals might not want people to come from the outside. They might relish people coming from the outside. They might be hostile towards the PCs. They might be welcoming. All kinds of things. You can just play through it, randomly determine which one you want to go to. And remember that that should come back. All of the answers to these questions should be derived. I'm just going to skip through here quickly back to the second slide. All of these things are based on what type of purpose does the planet serve within your game? I think that's very, very important. Now, before I go, I want to show you this website because I discovered it when I was preparing for this video. I was like, OK, well, what is out there that we can use to generate cool sci fi stuff, sci fi planets? Is there something out there? Because Internet says that there should be. I found this donjon.bin.sh. So donjon.bin.sh forward slash sci fi world forward slash world forward slash. It's amazing for creating worlds on the fly. If you have this available to you, grab it. If you are playing a game and you have a display, this is perfect for when the characters come across the planet. Now, bearing in mind, this will only create planets that have a sense of habitation upon them. It doesn't create gas giants. It just creates planets. There's all kinds of things you can go in here. There's a random name generator. Uh, well, there's a, a name space here, so you can type in your own name. You can choose random seed for the type of planet that it is. You can control all these different settings. How much water is there? Let's go with 75% coverage, 35% ice, uh, the size, the height, all those kinds of things. You can really choose it, and then you click on create. And this is my favorite part. 
So I've chosen animated map. So you're getting a scan of the planet. You can see it's a single continent, a Pangaea of sorts, dominated by a central mountain space. There's a massive ocean, North and South Pole. The Southern Pole, the Southern Pole is bigger than the Northern Pole, but very large amounts of beaches all over. The, and again, that central mountainous core. But look at all of the other detail that Donjon gives us. Well, it's about the same size as Earth, as a matter of fact, 6,664 kilometers in radius. It um, has the same density as Earth, so that's very good. The composition, I'm scanning 31.7% iron, Captain, 16.6% uh, silicon, 14% nickel. It's pretty much Earth. The gravity is 1.13 times that of Earth, so no ma major problems. It has a 29-hour day. Okay, so that's not too bad. We've got 75% water on the planet. That's great. What is our atmosphere? 27% sulfur dioxide combined with 75% water. That means acid rain. Acid rain. 23% argon. 18% carbon dioxide. It's hot. It's hot on that planet. 16% nitrogen. Well, the plants love it. 14% methane. Methane with sulfur dioxide, this planet stinks. And then trace other gases. No oxygen. That means that our characters need to put on a helmet. Oh, goodness. They wouldn't want to step out here. And then look at our temperatures. It's cold. Um, not really. I would actually disagree with that one. Minus 7 is the minimum temperature. That's not too cold. That's degrees Celsius. 13 degrees is the average temperature. Okay, it's nippy. It's nippy. 51 degrees centigrade that's terrifying now the biosphere the chemistry it's even suggesting the aliens are comprised out of sulfur how interesting is that because look microbes algae and sentient humanoids that are based off of sulfur i, I just want to make them egg-shaped creatures these big round white egg-shaped things that live off sulfurous pools but a little bit of research will reveal that we get extremophiles here on Earth, different types of algae that live around volcanic vents, feeding off of that sulfur. So we can go and look into that. It is an alien homeworld. Ha ha! A population of 24 million. It's a military dictatorship. So these little egg-like creatures running around in the digital age. Fuel cells, digital computers, robotics. No starships. That's pretty cool. But there might be some satellites that detect us. And then they have four moons and planetary rings. This is super cool. Mm, but let's try another one. Oops, wait, that's going to do the same thing because I didn't hit the random button. There's the random button. Here we go. New planet. Now it's just a colony. Nitrogen phosphorus based creatures. Still a nitrogen, carbon, sulfur atmosphere. Not a nice planet to live. It's only 15, 15 hour long day. So you work less time because that's pretty cool. So you can really work through this again. We've just got so much water happening. 23 hour day. It's not bad. Pretty close to Earth. What have we got in the air? Argon, carbon dioxide. Yeah, thin, toxic atmosphere. So what a delightful resource for us to have as, as game masters. So that's donjon.bin.sh. I'll put the link down below if I remember. I hope I do. And what a wonderful, wonderful resource to just randomly generate planets as you so choose. I think that's fantastic. So John, uh, John Olson, thank you for making this resource available to us what resources do you have available what do you know about that i don't know about share it down below let us know sharing is caring or join us on discord that's discord.gg forward slash great gm we are partners now with discord so they've given us our own little um handle thing much better than all of the code and stuff join us there and we can talk more about it as well until next week however i wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming Captain's log. We've scanned and scanned and scanned. And we're over it. We're done. We're washed up. We're finished. We're through. We didn't like what we found once we got there. None of them would subscribe to our pamphlets or our emails. And so I'm ringing the bell on this one. It's time to call it quits. We're going home. Maybe, maybe there we'll finally find peace.